So it's no secret that people don't usually like reading long blocks of text. So if you're writing a report or a research paper, how might you break it up with some ways to display data that aren't textual or even solely numerical? This video will teach you some simple basics for visualizing data in things like charts, graphs, tables, and infographics. There'll be some do's and don'ts and some key considerations for what to highlight and what to include in your data visualizations. My name is Allegra Smith. I'm an instructor in the English department at Purdue and a PhD student in the Rhetoric and Composition program. And I'll teach you some key tools and terms for visualizing data in your writing projects. To begin with, I have a few criteria for getting started with data visualizations. The first thing when you're thinking about incorporating a chart, table, graph, or other visualization into a written report is to be clear on the question that you're answering with your visualization. How is the visual you're providing going to help the reader? Is it going to say condense what would be a page or a paragraph into one simple chart? Is it going to make something more concrete or understandable or actionable for them? This can also help you to zoom in on the key variable you're showing to prevent what we call comparing apples to oranges or mixing multiple variables, which can get confusing for your reader. Second, you should be familiar with the data or information that you're trying to illustrate and start with basic visualizations before you get into more complicated ones. Consider, for instance, what variables you're trying to plot and illustrate here. If you have a graph, what are the x-axis or horizontal axis and y-axis or vertical axis going to refer to? Will the size or color mean anything? Are you trying to, say, identify trends over time or correlations between variables? And this again becomes important when we're differentiating between different types of charts and graphs. So here's a simple data visualization showing off how women are more likely to attend morning classes at a particular university, whereas men are more likely to attend evening classes. Now, which is the more appropriate visualization here? The pie chart or the bar graph? Well, pie charts are good at showing off proportions. And so they're more appropriate for this particular visualization to demonstrate the relative scale Right? We see in morning classes, women make up almost 75%, and it's a lot easier to visualize in the pie chart than in the bar graph. Step three, think about the messages of the visualization and generate the most informative indicator. This means you need to know your data set well and what each, and what each item or variable represents. You might also need to highlight relationships between different points in the data or provide additional interpretation to make this clear to your reader. Fourth, you can finally get into different types of visualization and choose the right type of chart, graph, or a combination thereof that best fits your purpose and audience. I've listed a few different types of charts here. We're probably most familiar with bar chart, line charts, and pie charts, um, as well as perhaps more common visualizations like Venn diagrams or maps. But in actuality, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of different types of visualizations available to you. This is the periodic table of visualization methods, and it's available online, and you can hover over some of these different um, method types to see an example and learn more about them. I bet you've never heard of, say, a layer chart or a um, perspectives diagram before. You can take a look at this, it'll be linked with this video, to understand some more complex ways that you might visualize your data. And there are some visualizations you might be familiar with that you haven't even considered for your project. 
Fifth and finally, you're going to want to finesse the smaller and the more finite design principles of your data visualization to make sure you're getting across your point accurately and in the most impactful way possible. Try out color, size, scale, shapes, and labels to direct attention to the key messages of your data visualization. Make them readable and usable by your target audience by making the important elements easy to identify. Nothing's worse than a data visualization where you can't quite understand the scale or interpret it without additional help from someone. This is a way of minimizing friction between your reader and their task. You don't want to make them work hard to get your message. You don't want to put barriers between them and the information you're trying to provide. So I have a few examples of particularly bad data visualizations that I'll walk you through so that you can consider how to convey your information in the most accurate and aesthetically pleasing way. And again, reduce the barriers between your reader and the task they're trying to complete or the information they're trying to get. At first glance, this seems like a pretty dynamic data visualization. It's showing off the sheer enormity of the sales of some fast food chains um, that are multinational, like McDonald's, Burger King, Starbucks, and Taco Bell. However, uh, the scale on the right-hand side doesn't have um, a particular uh, unit listed. Right, the units are next to the various country, the various companies in the country. The country of Afghanistan is kind of hidden behind all of these. But the worst problem here is scale. So you see that McDonald's here has $41 billion in sales, roughly 10 times as much as Starbucks, which has $4.1 billion in sales. But while McDonald's is 10 times the height of Starbucks, it's also several times the width of Starbucks, leading you to believe that instead of being 10 times as big, it's more like 100 times as big. So it's a bit misleading in terms of its size. Here's another one. This is from a news story about lowering the drinking age across Canada. There was a, um, a vote to determine if the drinking age would be lowered from 19 to 18 in the province of Saskatchewan, and the vote failed. So they provided this handy dandy graph to demonstrate the drinking age across different provinces and territories. What's wrong with this? So many things. First off, it's showing off in a graph what you could really show off in a sentence, saying, other than Quebec, Manitoba, and Alberta, the drinking age across Canada is 19 consistently. Done. But also, the scale is kind of strange. Humans don't really think in six tenths of a year. Uh, so it's a little confusing. The rule lines as well, since there are half rule lines in addition to the whole rule lines across the graph. Just generally an unnecessary visualization that also leads to some significant confusion. Here's one that's particularly terrible. I think that this was probably just a dummy graph put in by a newspaper editor so that they would change the bar heights later when they got the data, but they never quite got around to it. So this is from data from the National Collegiate Health Assessment in the University of California, Santa Barbara. And it's showing the difference between the perceived substance abuse that folks thought their peers were engaging in versus the actual amount of substance abuse. So the perceived numbers are in red on the right and the actual numbers are in white on the left. But note that all of the bars are exactly the same size. There's no rule lines given to indicate units or scale. And also the 0% bar, for example, for opiates or cocaine, is the same size as the 56.9% bar for alcohol. So do yourself a favor and proof your graphs and charts before you publish them. Here's one more that's confusing with units and scale. So this is in general a good idea to begin with, I think. It's using colors in um, 
city abbreviations to demonstrate the differences in commuting to work across major metropolitan areas in the US. And at first glance, it seems pretty effective. You can see that without a doubt, more people drive themselves to work in Houston than any of these other metropolitan areas, and more people take public transport in New York City. A couple of other noteworthy things is that Seattle and Atlanta are more bikeable than some of these other places. And there's a very small proportion of people who walk to work in hotter places like Houston, Atlanta, and LA. But then when you take a closer look at it, you see an attempt at scale in these grid lines in the middle, but no actual scale articulated. So there's no real way to compare these factors or to give an actual numerical indicator of what all of this means. The author needs to do some unpacking or interpreting of this for their reader to make it a truly effective data visualization. So now that we've looked at some examples of the bad, I wanna show you some good and some potential options for visualizing data that you may not have considered. We think sometimes that visualizations have to be complex or statistical or scientific, but they can also be creative or whimsical and still get the point across. So here are a few different basic types of visualizations you might think about employing sometime. Charts and ratios and percentages are a great way of showing parts of a whole. Just like this humorous pie chart that shows that the creative process is mostly binge eating and random internet surfing with actually very little inspiration or work getting done. I know I feel this way about writing quite frequently. Infographics or diagrams that show off parts of a thing or a process can be helpful. This is from a student who went to college with me who introduced himself to the class by creating an infographic of himself, showing off his average hours of sleep per week, his usual daily activities, the typical coffee consumption, and different things that he cared about, his interests, his favorite food, and the way he got work done. You could easily use this to show off a process in your major or field of study or to give a sense of a broad overview of a situation, problem, or phenomenon. Networks, systems, and ecologies can also show, show parts of a more complex thing. Systems, bio, um, biospheres, environments. This is after network mapping, which is a way to understand how technologies, people, and situations work together. So here's an actor network map that shows how different technologies are inputs into a way to try and understand and map survivors and casualties in a terrorist attack. This is a way for researchers to show off field-based research and the different actors in a system. Complex visualizations can combine a number of different ones to give them more power than they would have individually. Things like infographics that are printed in magazines, newspapers, and online publications often do this. Here's a visualization uh, infographic about feminism and gender rights across the world. Notice how we have lots of different types of data visualizations here. We've got a map, we've got some line charts, we have different scale uh, in graphs showing off, for example, gender parity in legislatures across the uh, world, as well as the pay gap in the United States between white men and women of different races. We've got lots of different figures here, as well as images representing and symbolizing different gendered phenomena. Note also how this author cites their sources they use numbers and then provide a complete citation in the lower right hand corner to give credit to where the data came from. Another example of a complex visualization here about earthquakes. I like the consistency in colors, in alignments, and in contrast across this infographic, as well as how it uses maps 
to demonstrate earthquake hotspots globally. A couple of smaller infographics about biotechnology for agriculture as well as renewable energy. Again, showing off ways that you can combine multiple visualizations in a single cohesive package, making them stronger than they would be individually. So how might you go about creating some of these more basic visuals for your own purposes? If you don't know about the Microsoft Office Smart Art tool, allow me to introduce it to you. It can be extremely helpful for integrating charts and graphs into your work if you're creating a report in PowerPoint, Word, Publisher, or another Microsoft Office Suite application. So I'm showing it off here in PowerPoint, but the navigation ribbon and buttons look the same across most Office apps. So if you go to Insert and Chart, you can create a line graph, a bar graph, a pie chart, and all of these other interesting options. Note the simple chart that I made about my family's interest in the presidential election in 2016. It's a very easy way to demonstrate that my father's interest gradually went up, my mother's interest gradually went down, and mine reached a low in September and then sharply peaked leading up to the election in November. Of course, there are some issues here, like what is the scale? What does an N of 10 mean here versus an N of 2? How am I measuring interest? But as you can see, it's a nice way to quickly visualize some data. You can also use SmartArt, which is typically close to the charts function in, Word, in Office excuse me, applications. SmartArt are graphic visualizations to communicate information. They're often less numerically heavy, so they're better for representing, say, qualitative data, like processes or concepts. You can see the different types of smart art graphics here, like cycles, hierarchies, matrices, pyramids, and more. I use the cycle option to create a quick reduce, reuse, recycle graphic. It's simple, but it's powerful. You can supplement your text with visuals using free online tools. You can search for royalty-free stock photography on websites like Pexels or Unsplash, or you could use my favorite site, The Noun Project, to find open source free icons that you can use in documents, presentations, and projects. Just don't forget to credit the icon's creator. Give credit where credit is due for their creative work. So why is it important for us to consider data visualization? Because we tell stories with both numerical and quantitative data. We're able to illustrate themes in ways that are more powerful and interesting and compelling than if we said, than if we had, say, that page or two pages full of uninterrupted text. This TED Talk video, uh, Making Data Mean More Through Storytelling, demonstrates how you could take big data sets and tell stories about places like New York City. I hope you'll watch that video and learn a little bit more about why it's important for us to consider how we leverage our data and how we represent it for particular audiences. Thanks for watching and happy data visualization.